Hey everyone, Joe Grand here in a hotel room in an undisclosed location, bringing you a demonstration of extracting firmware through a JTAG interface. A few years ago, I was in another hotel room and tweeted a picture of doing this exact same thing. Didn't really give any details, and after the fact, people were asking me questions, so I figure, what better time than to uh, make a video about it? My target board for this demonstration is a Linksys WRT54G. These things have been around for a long time, super hackable, lots of information about them online. You can uh, get them pretty cheap at thrift stores and on eBay. These are really a great platform to start working with if you're interested in uh, learning about hardware hacking and exploring different types of embedded systems. So JTAG is an industry standard interface that really was designed for low-level chip testing. Nowadays, when we think of JTAG, we think of device programming, debugging, um, but it didn't start that way, and vendors over time have added functionality. I've given talks about JTAG in the past, so you can find some of those videos on YouTube. But today what we're going to be doing is using JTAG over a tool called the Bus Blaster to connect to the JTAG interface of our target that's going to communicate with the CPU, and then the CPU will communicate for us to the memory, and then we'll be able to extract the content. So what we have set up here is our target board. We have our JTAG connector down here, and there's ground on one side and the signals on the other. So I wired those directly up to the bus blaster. On the bus blaster, on the silk screen, there's actually the signal names right on here. So you just have to make sure you run the cables to the right spots here. And then the bus blaster is connected and controlled over USB. That goes to my host computer. Everything else is done in software. So the first thing we need to do is run the UR JTAG tool. And I already have that pre-installed on my machine, so I can just type JTAG, and it's going to load up. So what we need to do to get our hardware set up is we're going to define the JTAG hardware that we're using. So we're going to type cable, JTAG key, put a vendor ID of 0403 and a product ID of 6010. This vendor ID and product ID and this JTAG key is basically a general purpose JTAG hardware based on an FTDI FT2232 USB to serial adapter. So the bus blaster that we're using uh, is essentially the same as the JTAG key. We're going to specify interface zero, which is one of the two interfaces for the FT232H. All right, we see connected to lib FTDI driver. So now we're good to go. What we can do is actually type detect now, and we're going to look out the bus blaster is going to try to communicate over JTAG on the, the pins that we've connected on those signals and query the JTAG chain and see if it can detect any devices. And here we go. So we can actually see the device ID that was returned by the chip, 1471217F. And UR JTAG even parses that out and tells us, okay, it's manufacturer of Broadcom, BCM4712 chip, which is uh, pretty handy. So now what we can do, now that we've detected the device on the chain, this Broadcom chip, the BCM4712, is a MIPS architecture. And there's some additional functionality for MIPS called eJTAG, which stands for Enhanced JTAG. And what that is is basically debugging and programming functionality built on top of the JTAG specification. Because JTAG itself doesn't define any high-level kind of functionality commands, but for MIPS, this Enhanced JTAG is part of that architecture. And URJTAG supports that. So we can just tell URJTAG to initialize the EJTAG functionality of the chip we're connected to. And right away, we get a response back. We see processor entered debug mode. So now we're communicating through URJTAG to the bus blaster, to the WRT54G, to the Broadcom CPU, and now we're actually in a debug mode, which is pretty cool. Now, if you're dealing with another type of architecture or some other type of target chip, this particular command might not work. This particular process as a whole might not work. What we can do now is take advantage of another command within your JTAG called detect flash. And that's going to query the CPU and basically twiddle the bits of the CPU through JTAG and reach out and see if it can detect any external memory connected to it. So we're going to type in our base address here of 3C000000. And this base address, you need to tell the command where to start looking for the memory. And this is something that I had discovered through looking at the UART output, the boot log information, as this router was booting up. The base address that it actually printed in the UART output was 1C000000. So I did a little bit of kind of guessing. If for some reason you don't know the base address, if you can't get any other clues, you might have to do some brute forcing until you actually get the correct response back from the tool. So let's see if we can detect the attached memory. We see a whole bunch of information coming back. This is part of the CFI specification, the Common Flash Interface. and 
this information that's coming back is actually stored on the chip, on the memory device, and sent back to us. So we can see some of the low-level kind of configuration stuff. We see our device size, so it's a four megabyte flash. And that makes sense because the device on this Linksys board is an Intel flash, it's a 28F320, and a bunch of other information. So now that we can actually communicate to the memory device, we can just try to read the memory. So we're gonna type in the read mem command with our base address, and let's go for the whole enchilada all at once. 400,000 hex, that's four megabytes. Save that to a file, dump.bin, and give that a go. All right, so that dump took uh, just a little bit under five hours. And extraction over JTAG is generally relatively slow compared to other methods because we're communicating to the target device serially and there's just a lot of information that needs to be transferred and we're basically just shifting data in and shifting data out per the JTAG spec. Usually though, if we're extracting memory in this way, time is not of the essence, so we just wait for it to take as long as it needs to take. One of the first things that I'll do once I uh, successfully extract a binary blob is to run strings on it. Strings is gonna show us all of the printable ASCII text that's within that binary blob. And you can see there's all sorts of information in here in the clear, stored in the memory. Things like passwords, names of access points, there's mine, Joe Grand, WRT54G, and lots of information in there that you don't even really have to do any sort of complex reverse engineering to get information about the target. Another tool we can use is binwalk, which is going to look for known signatures and known headers of things like file systems and zip files and image files. And it really makes it a lot easier for us to take a large binary dump. Like in our case, four megabytes is really big and not something that we would generally just start reverse engineering without knowing what we're looking at. So binwalk is really gonna give us a clue about what's actually contained within that binary. Once you've successfully extracted firmware from the memory, then your hardware problem basically becomes a software problem. There are lots of great people doing some amazing firmware reverse engineering and exploitation that you can learn from. Take a look at the exploiteers who do a lot of crazy consumer electronics hacking. Chris Eagle is the Ida Pro master. Azeria doing a whole bunch of ARM exploitation. And Craig Hefner who does a lot of routers and uh, network types of devices. Once again, I'm Joe Grand signing off and hope this video is useful to give you some tips about another way to extract memory. Firmware extraction through the JTAG interface, successful.